Today, um, we have MD Group. Uh, MD Group is uh, one of Mobile's members, and we're super thrilled to um, uh, have them uh, join with us. They asked for um, an opportunity to share their story. And with us today is La Quinta Jernigan. La Quinta is the Executive Vice President of Commercial for North America. And uh, as the head of the North America for MD Group, she brings a wealth of healthcare knowledge and expertise in building sustainable, strong commercial relationships. And uh, I think the key, uh, I'm not gonna go on and on in, the, but in, in her introduction, but a, a key part of what I've he heard from uh, my private conversation with La Quinta ahead of time is that it goes back to listening carefully. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. And everyone, I'm really happy to be here today um, to talk a little bit about MD Group and, and what we do. So MD Group, we are um, an organization that's been around for over 20 years. We got our start in hospitality. Um, so we were planning meetings in the life sciences industry and making sure that healthcare professionals were able to get to and from hotels and you know meetings ran smoothly and everyone's needs were met. We're met and we transitioned um, over time into patient services. Uh, it might seem like an odd transition, but for us, it was very natural because a lot of the benefits um, in being in, hosp in hospitality, they translate very well to patient, patient care and patient needs. So making sure that we're able to bring that same type of customer service and that same type of white glove service to the clinical side of things and giving that to patients instead of just on the, um, the healthcare professional for side for event attend for events that they are attending. Um, so it was a natural transition for us. And what we are seeking to do as an organization is to really change that patient experience. Um, when a patient is going through a clinical trial or making the decision to participate in a clinical trial, we want to make sure that the experience for them isn't overwhelmingly burden burdensome on the logistical side. So making sure that it's easy to participate in clinical trials and that clinical trials are accessible. And one of the topics I'm gonna to focus on in today's presentation is the idea of utilizing decentralized clinical trial solutions to reach some of those patients, make them more accessible and to open up uh, you know, clinical trials to more diverse populations. So MD Group, we are located um, in, a, in a few locations around the globe. So we have our, um, headquarters located in London, outside of London. Our U.S. headquarters is here in Durham, North Carolina. But we also have an office in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And then we have other locations scattered across the, the globe, including locations such as um, Singapore and Dublin. And we have remote teams in St. Petersburg, Russia, Hong Kong, and Brazil. Um, it's important for us to have locations or to have people um, in many different time zones locations because a lot of the studies that we work on and support are global global trials. So we want to make sure that we are accessible to all of our clients and patients and sites that need to work with us. Um, one thing that's interesting about MD Group is that we are a fully woman-owned um, company. So if any uh, organizations have diverse supplier initiatives or they're working with uh, on government grants and they need to have that diverse supplier kind of checkbox checked, we do fit that need by being a woman-owned um, supplier. So the patient experience. So when we, when we got into working with patients, um, one of the things that were really interesting to us is to understand what that experience is like for patients. Um, on the side that we sit on um, in clinical trials and supporting HCPs and planning their, their educational events, we often got to see what the protocols were like and hear from the physicians that were supporting those clinical trials. But when we started digging on the patient side of things, it was very relevant that things were not as um, easy as they seemed. A lot of patients, um, when they're participating in clinical trials, are often faced with huge financial um, hurdles that they have to overcome. When it came to actual patient experience and, um, and their participation in clinical trials, one of the things that we were quick to understand is that the demands of clinical trials are great on patients. Um, protocols are written as such that there are several, there are many visits that a patient has to commit to. And sometimes, especially when you're dealing with rare disease clinical trials, 
patients have to travel far distances to get to their appointments. So when they're just making the decision on whether or not they want to screen for a trial or participate, they have to juggle all of these items. They have to make sure that the trial is gonna fit within their family schedules. Are we gonna be able to commit to going to all these appointments? Well, I have the money to kind of put out front to travel to these appointments, um, buy plane tickets, stay in hotels, get train tickets, what have you. Um, but when we look at you know, this last year with the pandemic, we realize that a lot of things can be avoided. There are a lot of solutions that can come into play. And that's really where I'm gonna talk about kind of how we adapted some of these decentralized solutions during the pandemic and how they're gonna stick with us for a long time. But making sure that we're able to meet these needs of the patients and reduce some of these burdens are key in engaging patients and retaining them. So that's where MD Group really came in to decide this is where, our, where we're gonna fit in. This is gonna be the, what we bring to the industry. We're gonna change all of this for patients and make life a lot easier when it comes to them visiting or participating in clinical trials. So there's lots of research on this um, and you could, you could Google this and find tons of white papers um, and different types of uh, publications. But patients typically drop out of clinical trials for the reasons that you see on your screen, some of which I've already talked about. Um, fear and anxiety is one that is really high up there and it's really just not understanding what's going to happen. Um, a lot of times documents that patients have to review for clinical trials are written in a way that don't necessarily meet their educational levels. Um, where they're written in for physicians and other clinical people to understand and to read. Um, so it's being able to kind of pr provide explanation to them that makes sense, speaking to them in a way that they understand so that they can be prepared and know what's happening. Um, we can come in with that because we provide kind of a liaison with that patient and the um, study team that they'll be working with. So when we're working with patients, we're trying to understand exactly what they need in order to participate in a clinical trial. Do you need childcare? Do you need to have your costs covered up front? Do you need to fly or do you need to drive? What are some of your preferences? We explain how everything's gonna work on our side. We take care of all those logis logistics and it gives them a little bit of comfort in knowing what to expect, knowing what to expect from the travel needs and to know that their schedules are being taken care of. And then of course, with other options, that the other items listed on this slide here, forgetting appointments, not fully understanding expectations. Of course, these are all things that we assist with as well by giving appointment reminders and making sure we work with them and their family calendars to get those appointments booked. Next slide, please. So now that we know kind of the, the, the problem um, when it comes to patients and that their experience in clinical trials, we can now talk a little bit about why decentralized solutions work really well um, in tackling some of these problems. Studies have revealed that 70% um, of patients live more than two hours from a research site. Um, this is obviously going to be an issue because again, travel can be a huge concern for patients when it comes to clinical trials. And even if they commit to the travel, there's the cost that's involved with that. We can reimburse the cost, we can cover the cost, but still at the end of the day, if you have to travel four hours round trip to get to an appointment, it can become a problem if you're doing that on a high frequency. Um, and 50% of clinical trials participants say it's difficult to stay involved, enrolled due to poor health. So you have some trials where patients, their health uh, decreases over time. And so when you couple that with the fact that they're making a four hour trip, it can become really uncomfortable and just not convenient um, at all to do and to keep with those types of visits. And then of course, 85% of trials fail to retain enough patients anyways to meet their critical um, data requirements. Next slide, please. So the benefits of using a decentralized model and you know, this is something that we're really proud to kind of sit in the space, but we work with a lot of other companies out there who contribute to the space. But um, the benefits to creating a de using decentralized tools is that you can increase the emphasis on the overall patient experience and convenience. Um, and decentralized trials doesn't mean fully virtual. Um, it means that there can be an, a variety of options for patients and for trials from fully virtual to hybrid models. But the key focus and the objective is to make them allow more choices and options for patients participation. 
Um, a decentralized trial encompasses a range of solutions that can include digital tools for capturing consent data, uh, the use of telehealth providers, direct patient drug distribution, um, remote monitoring and diagnostics, and the use of local labs and imaging centers. Um, so there's a lot of components and a lot of players in this space that come together to provide these solutions and options for patients. So it basically, decentralized clinical trials are going to be those who use novel technologies or processes to create options for participation outside of the conventional clinical settings, um, and it improves overall access and convenience. So when you can go to a patient, you can say that, you know, the protocol will now allow for you to come to a, the site for maybe four out of 12 visits, and then the rest of those visits can happen either in a local lab near their home or in their home. It just makes the participation so much easier for the patient. Um, and it also helps remove some of those burdens that we spoke about before. And we've seen this happen during the pandemic inside clinical trials and out, especially with the rise of popularity and using telehealth platforms. Not only are clinical trials utilizing them, but your own physician is probably using telehealth platforms as well. And it was a requirement um, you know, to kind of combat COVID, but we feel that this is something that we're gonna see in both spaces continue on because of the convenience that it does provide and how it really does help kind of take down some of those barriers. It increases accessibility um, and it, overall it makes access a lot easier. Next slide, please. When we talk about DCTs, um, it's not just a reduced burden for the patients. It, it, using these types of solutions provide tremendous um, um, help and support to the sites. Um, you know, participants can be enrolled at traditional clinical trial sites, uh, while others may be enrolled or managed in a decentralized or remote manner. And when we can leverage telemedicine and other emerging kind of novel information technology services, this offers um, for the potential for local healthcare professionals to participate in clinical trials. Um, and this is a, one of the key factors when we talk about another uh, topic that's gaining in popularity within the uh, clinical research industry, that's diversity in clinical trials. And one of the ways to tackle that issue is to open clinical trials up to a more broader variety of healthcare professionals uh, and sites that may not be used to or may be very um, new to clinical research, but being able to tap, tap into those hospitals and those community centers will help increase diversity in clinical trials and using some of these decentralized models will give them the bandwidth to do that. Um, so we can, using DCs can also provide several advantages compared to traditional clinical trials that are conducted at a more centralized um, clinical trial site. Um, this can include features such as um, faster trial participant recruitment, um, which can accelerate uh, trial participant access. Um, and then also, you know, it, it gives access to important medical interventions and reduces costs for sponsors. Um, so really, it's not just the patient that benefits from this. Um, the industry as a whole benefits, the sites and the sponsors as well. It saves money, it helps to build new clinical research sites. And then the last point um, on my uh, slide here is it streamlines our IRB and regulatory review. Um, so this is something that I know will is a, a huge factor for our industry. And by utilizing some of these solutions, we can help make that a more streamlined um, approach, especially as all the different players come together and provide processes that everyone can follow. You can go to the next slide. So when we talk about um, just using some of these solutions, um, another huge benefit um, not only for, you know, for the patient to reduce the burden and overall accessibility, but another benefit is increasing um, patient engagement. Um, so once you have a patient who passes enrollment and they're enrolled, that's, that's only half of the problem or half of the challenge solved. Now you have to engage with that patient and retain that patient and keep them in the trial. And this is where it gets really tricky for clinical trials. Most trials experience huge dropout rates um, once they have a patient enrolled. And when you're working with a rare disease, this is absolutely detrimental. You have to hold on to those patients. Um, so decentralized solutions, um, they kind of bring to the table some new tools and resources that we can use that helps increase that engagement. Um, research, decentralized research can leverage available technologies 
that will help recruit a more broadly representative patient population by gender, ethnicity, ge geography, income, and, and many more categories. When we look at remote monitoring um, and communication technologies, um, it makes it possible for researchers to check in with participants as often as needed. Um, so we no longer have to just wait for that next visit to see how they're doing, to make sure they're um, complying with all of the different guidelines and rules. We can check in on a much higher frequency. So rather than once a week or a month, we can do it um, as frequently as we want. Um, we also are able to collect biometric information a lot easier using some of the technologies that are available to us in these types of settings. Um, information like heart rate or activity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, et cetera. Um, we can do that through the use of um, e-diaries. We can use, do it through the use of wearable technology. So there's lots of different resources that we can implement into a trial now to really have that monitoring happen remotely on a more higher frequency. Um, in addition to supporting kind of the whole idea of patient centricity and engagement goals that most life sciences organizations have already adopted, um, DCTs do give better access to uh, by participants across um, all the demographics, such as race, sex, age and geography, and other demographics offered by decentralized clinical trials provides the data we need to understand dosing, efficacy, and safety for the broadest possible range of patients. Um, so again, um, this kind of ties back into the issue of diversity in clinical trials, which is an issue that really does limit us in our abilities to ensure that all of the um, information and that we're collecting from these trials really do really is pertinent and pertains to all communities. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. So technology, like I said, is a huge component, but I do have to kind of like um, give the disclaimer about technology because when we look at DCTs, tech is a huge part of it, but there are a lot of considerations that we must take into place when we um, do bring tech into the picture. Um, so one of those is digital education. Um, when it comes to patients, we have to make sure that the education is there to adapt that technology. So for example, this year during COVID, bringing telehealth platforms to most patients, um, there had to be education on how those platforms worked. Um, when there is an education, there is a lack of understanding, and sometimes that can lead to frustration, and it could mean that the technology isn't adapt as isn't taken on by patients um, as high, highly as we would like them to. So making sure that the educational component is there and that you have that educational component put in a way that makes sense to your population. That may mean that you need to address different populations differently, but we have to make sure that everyone is fully understanding what the, the technology can do and how to operate it. You also have to consider the patient's expectations of technology. So we live in a world where most people have access to apps, they have devices, they have iPhones, and they know how they work. So if we're gonna introduce a new technology in this space, we have to realize that that comes with some pre notions of how it will work. If the technology we're introducing isn't as fast, isn't as user friendly, and doesn't have a easily, um, an easy to navigate interface, then that could lead to less people using it because it doesn't meet the expectations that everyday technology provides people with. And then technological integration. Um, in this, like I mentioned before, so many times there are lots of players in this space um, and not one player does the same thing as the other. So for most trials, you're going to have a lot of different suppliers providing different needs and aspects of the clinical trial. And if all of those suppliers have their own technology, this can prove to be very challenging for a patient participating. And remember, we wanna make this easy for patients because we want to make it more accessible and have them stick with the program. So it's really important to consider how technologies can integrate with one another um, so that we can streamline processes and streamline technology so that it's easily accessible by the patient and by the site because nobody really likes having to log into several different platforms um, for one given project a day. We wanna make things very simple. And then finally, one that's not on the slide is also keeping in mind that not all patients have the access to technology that we do. So while we think that you know it's very easy to access a telehealth platform because we have computers and we have internet at home, not everyone does. So when we bring these types of solutions to clinical trials, we have to keep that in mind. And we have to make, um, make sure that there are provisions in place for patients that do not have Wi-Fi, do not have computer access so that they can still participate using the technology 
that we want to put in place to make the trial run a lot smoother for them. If you have any questions, um, you can email me directly at laquinta.jernigan at MD Group. I'm always happy to talk about this topic, to talk about diversity in clinical trials, and to talk about decentralized clinical trial solutions. Um, so please feel free to email me any questions. I unfortunately have a family situation today and my time is cut short. So I would love to stick with you for the full hour, but I have to hop. But again, Kelly and Michelle, thank you for being patient with me during my colossal technical difficulties today um, and for running the slides for me. LaQuinta, you, you handle it like an absolute pro. Please go be with uh, the family that needs you most. And uh, we, we uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction. I have provided to everyone in the chat session um, your email address, uh, along with that invitation that if anyone has any additional questions, they should reach out to LaQuinta directly and uh, get themselves introduced as well. So there's a, see if there's any potential collaborations. I, I saw some of our participants, I thought, okay, well that IRB probably needs to be talking to MD group and, and, and sharing what, what they're each doing. Uh, so drop off if you need to. One last Thank announcement you. for everyone. The next mobile breakthrough is June 23rd at 11 a.m. It's going to be brought to us by BSA Life Structures, and it's going to be discussing the recent expansion at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City and uh, all the neat things that they're doing for pediatric care in the future. And um, David Miller, you're on from BSA Life Structures. Do you want to add anything to that mention that I just uh, plugged? Sure. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is the new 400,000 square foot Children's Mercy Research Institute. Uh, just an amazing facility uh, of discovery uh, for looking at uh, children's diseases and their cures. Um, it's just, If you haven't seen it up on the Hospital Hill. It's an amazing structure uh, that is really put uh, the city on the map in terms of uh, research for children's diseases. Only 10% of federal funding in that area goes to children's research. So this is really uh, something special for, for, the, for the whole region. And, and the building is just amazing. Great. I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. June 23rd, 11 a.m. And with that, we thank you for your time. We give back an extra 25 minutes to your day and we uh, will see you around the mobile corner soon. Thank you, everybody.